Well, good morning, friends. This is Pastor Kirby. It's so wonderful that uh, we can share this time together, even if it's online. We know we can be together and celebrating. And I hope you had a wonderful Christmas time. Uh, family, friends, some food, some time off, uh, whatever it was that you got what you were hoping for and needing uh, in that. And uh, so as, tra- as we've done the last several years here at Living Hope is the first Sunday directly after Christmas, we've just gathered online only. Um, and the reason for that is um, give our amazing ministry partners, um, those who make this place function every week in our kids area, coffee area, greeters, all those amazing people, uh, gives them a much needed time off, just a nice break. Um, And frankly, it also gives your ministry staff some time off to be with their family, to be with their friends, to just rest uh, for the coming year. And so we get to gather online and we get to worship together. And this year, I mean, really excited, we get to hear from Pastor Wes Smith. Pastor Wes is the district superintendent of the Northwest District of the Wesleyan Church. He is my boss. He is my friend, my uh, mentor. Uh, and I'm really excited to hear what he has to say about Psalm 23. Um, I promise it's going to be something you maybe haven't heard before. Um, many of us know that psalm. It's a beloved psalm. Uh, but I think you're going to be really encouraged uh, by what he has to say to us this morning and uh, what he can tell us. So, But I hope you'll join us next week if you're looking for a church home uh, or this is your regular church home. We meet Sunday mornings at 930 Uh, right here at Living Hope Wesleyan Church, the old Lincoln Elementary, uh, Northwest 3rd Street. Um, So you can find all the information at lhwc.org, all the social media stuff. Uh, We are present there as well. So if you're looking for a church home, we want to gather. Uh, So next Sunday, December 7th, we gather together in person for the first time in the year 2024. Uh, that's crazy to think about, but uh, we're going to do it with our songs and stories service. We'll hope you can gather with us there as songs and stories to share stories about a song that has been meaningful to the people involved. And you can hear their stories. We get to sing those songs together. Um, if you still have your tithes and your offering, you can do that at lhwc.org slash giving. Um, you can set it up online there. You can mail it in or bring it to uh, the box next week when you show up. Um, but if you have any other questions, don't feel free. To, uh, don't be afraid to reach out. Um, get a hold of us. Um, see how we can do uh, what we can do to help and serve and, and love and answer any questions. Uh, but with that being said, I, I thank you, Pastor West, for joining us, and I and I hope uh, you're encouraged today. God bless you. Hi everyone. Hope life is good for you today. I'm excited to get to provide the teaching uh, this week. But before I do that, I just want to say as the district superintendent of the Northwest District, thank you very much for all you are doing as a church family. means a lot to the rest of us, the way you're contributing, the way you're ministering in your local community, the way you're reaching people for Christ. Please keep it up. Please keep it up. I know sometimes it can be hard. I know there's challenges these last few years, but you're thriving and and, uh, grateful for you, praying for you, and uh, just invite you to understand that you're part of a larger family, a larger context, and we're so grateful for all you do to contribute. As I said, I have the privilege of providing the teaching this week and something I love to do. And what I'd like to do is invite you to review either just in your mind, because I'm sure you've heard of Psalm 23 before, or open up your Bible or your app or however it is that you read God's Word to Psalm 23. And before you stop listening, because you've heard Psalm 23 so many times and probably have parts of it memorized, I, I want to take a fresh look at it with you. Uh, a mentor of mine some years ago, opened up Psalm 23 to me in a way that has had tremendous impact on my daily life, particularly my walk with God, but in so many areas. I'd always viewed that psalm as a great psalm to listen to, maybe a memorial service for somebody or at a graveside or in other settings. It's a, it's a traditional kind of piece of scripture that we've all heard. 
but it's it's more than I had understood and perhaps more than than, than, than you remember. And I, I hope today you can look at it with fresh eyes. The, the, the psalm ends uh, with this sort of magnificent life, right? I'll, I'll, God will prepare a table in the presence of an enemy. I'll dwell in the house of the Lord or I'll dwell in his presence forever. Even if I were to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't fear evil. It's this magnificent sort of end. And to understand the psalm correctly, you've got to, you, you sort of start with the end, and then you go back to the beginning and say, wait a minute, how did life get to be this way for the author of this psalm? We know the author to be David. And by the way, we know David lived a life full of enormous conflict, more than you probably live. He lived a life of deep regret. Really, he sinned big time and had regret and repentance, was called out publicly for it, lots of shame and humiliation. He, he experienced that. He, as I said, he experienced conflict. His family, there were some a massive highs and lows in his family. Uh, at one point, his son tried to, was trying to kill him. He, he experienced life turmoil, difficulty, at least as much as you and I have experienced and likely so much more. And yet in the midst of that, he said, I, I've learned how to live in such a way that it's like, it's like living in God's house all the time. And it's, it's this awesome community with God. It's this great way of living. Anxiety is gone. You know, it's, it's the way we want to live. So how did that practice happen in his life? Well, he outlines that with four choice points at the beginning of Psalm 23. And, and if you look at each of those choice points and diligently choose this way of living, I think you too can celebrate after the next three months or six months or 12 months a different kind of living, a different kind of way of living that is powerful. I know for me, as I said, it's been very impactful. So I want to take the first four phrases of Psalm 23, and I want to just reflect on them, discuss them, and maybe you'll choose to meditate on these for the next few days. And if you do, they can have impact. The first one, the first choice point is this. The Lord is my shepherd. This is not David. Uh, stating an, you know, a fact or making an observation. Those would be true. This is really a, a choice point. This is David saying, I have chosen for better or for worse, despite all the circumstances around me, I've decided the Lord will be my shepherd. Now, in his day, the relationship between sheep and shepherd would have been a common sort of analogy or metaphor, not so much in our day. Very few of you are probably shepherds. But the idea is this, that Sheep are actually quite insecure animals and 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 semi helpless animals would would be the idea that's how he's using it in a metaphor and so the relationship between sheep and shepherd they would really rely on the shepherd for a great deal of their security and care and direction and he is saying, "I have chosen to be in a relationship with the shepherd as a sheep would be he is my shepherd. That requires submission, offering ourselves in, in a submissive relationship, and then seeking his direction. This is a choice that can be very, very difficult to make. You have to have enormous trust in the shepherd to give up that authority. But that's David's first choice point and one that is critical to your life, the rest of your life. And we talk about there's the, the moment of conversion in which Jesus becomes the Lord of our life. He, 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 his, his atonement for us on the cross, in that he becomes our Savior, but we also choose to make him the Lord of our life. That's, that's how David's using shepherd here. So that's a, an initial decision. I know many of you have made that. I made that. It, it's been life-changing for so many of us. But there's also this daily, sometimes we in the church talk about taking up our cross daily. It is this choice every day to become as a sheep is to a shepherd. 
this, this offering ourselves as a living sacrifice. Doing that on a daily basis keeps this fresh for us, reminds us, and it reorients us to the relationship to the shepherd. So here's what I do. And I, I, I'm just going to use some personal notes here from my own sort of life that I use as a practice in this first choice point. So each day for me, I do, I do these three things. I say to God, first of all, I release, I let go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my marriage, uh, my children, the church that I lead, all of these things, and I'm going to release them back to you today. I, I have a tendency to kind of sort of take control or try to take control of the things in my life. And each day for me, it's important to say, Father, I, I, I give you this, this marriage, this, this child. I, I give you this other friendship. I give you the church, all the things I lead, my possessions. Actually, they're yours. I'll steward them as well as you want. But I'm going to let go of them. It's your, it's your church. It's your you know, fill in the blank, right? Uh, your school. It's your hospital. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to control and, and all this stuff and worry that comes up. I let go. And then I offer myself in sacrifice of praise. I offer myself to him. And then I do something that maybe you don't do in your time of prayer. I'd encourage you to do this. I ask some questions about how I might steward a relationship or a resource. Like in my marriage, I'll say, Father, today, how would you have me uh, respond to this area of conflict? Or with a particular child you know, of, of mine, I say, well, in this child relationship, I've got this challenge. How, how should I deal with this? Or as I lead in the area that I lead, like here's a conundrum I'm facing. What do I do? And then I do something that might be unique. It's, it was unique to me at first. I sort of shut up for a while. I, I give God a chance to respond in my mind. And then throughout the days, I ask that question. I let other people. It's amazing how much God was wanting to say to me that I never gave him a chance to, to speak into my life because I never shut up. <laughs> so now I take a moment. I ask the question. I pause, and I'm looking for the answer from God all day. I'd really encourage you to let him be your shepherd on a daily basis. Choose to let him be your shepherd every day, and something freeing starts to happen. I, I live with so much more freedom giving him the shepherd role every day because I wanted to take it back. No, you're the shepherd. I'm not the shepherd. You're the Lord. You take it. Here's some questions I don't know the answer to. Answer if you can't. I'll do my best to steward. So that's the first choice point. The second choice point, so the Lord is my shepherd, then I will choose. I shall not be in want. I won't be in any kind of want. I, whatever you provide will be enough for me. I'm going to live contented. And there's so much said. There's books written and sermons preached about contentment and discontentment. And we're all sort of on a journey to try to live it with contentment. And our world makes that hard, right? Our world makes it really hard. Uh, the next job or the next thing or the next relationship is always, the, we're, we're pursuing, we're pursuing in our world more than ever before. David says, I'm just going to choose to live not in want. Uh, and so here, here's the practice for me. You, you may remember, some of you that read, have read quite a bit of the Bible know that there was a, a situation in Jesus's ministry where he fed a whole bunch of people with a few loaves and, and, and fish. He, he starts that whole exercise in learning faith by asking those around him, his disciples. He asked them, he says, well, wh what do we have? What's available to us? And they say, well, there's, a, there, there's just a few pieces of bread and a few fish. It's not much. And Jesus said, well, let's just take those and see what we can do. And, it, and the principle is this. Always be noticing what it is that you have. Be, be, be practicing the awareness of it and be practicing gratitude for it. And that is how you'll choose this day not to live in want. So here's some practices for me. I regularly with, with God do an inventory. And I say this, 
here's what I have. You've given me a spouse, and in my case, a wife, who, who loves me. I'm just going to stop and say thank you for that. You've, you've given me children. Thank you. You've given me, and I'll name like three or four friendships. They, they actually want to engage in conversation with me and enjoy seeing me. And thank you. That's a pretty cool gift. You gave me this job. Some days I cuss at it, and some days I, it's hard. But boy, you gave it to me, and it makes a difference. And I'm grateful because I get to do stuff, and I have a mind and a mouth that operates and, and makes a difference. And thank you. And I just do an inventory of what it is I have. Like today I have two eyes and two ears and two hands, and I can do stuff. And I just I, I, I say thank you. And I go through that process on a daily basis. And then mealtime for me is part of this practice of not living in what? The Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes, it, it talks about eating a meal with, with, without joy is a sin. And I try to remember that. Like, like in some way during mealtime, I'm going to express gratitude, like authentic gratitude and joy, and just take my time and chew my food with joy. My mentor talks to me sometimes about the sin of not chewing my food with joy. And I just stop and and I, I shall not be, I choose not to be in want. I choose to notice what I have and I choose to be thankful for it and try not to obsess about what I don't. These are choice points. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. And then this next one. He makes me do lie in green pastures. <laughs> you know that resting well is a big deal to God. It's a really big deal. Such a big deal is it to God that right there early on in like the top 10 list, right? You've heard of the Ten Commandments. Right early on the top 10 list is one day every week rest rest right you know before murder was honor the sabbath resting well is a big deal to god well, some some of some of my journaling around this is 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 talking about the sin of not resting well because i think for me it can be a sin it, it, it really turns into to disobedience and distrust of the God I claim to serve when I'm not w willing to, to stop and cease from those things that drain me and let God pour into me through worship and rest and recreation. So I've got some questions that I ask myself. I'll just ask these of you. Uh, and you may want to you may want to make note of these and 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 let these be some accountability for you in this way. But but when the psalmist says, "I choose to lie down in green pastures," that's where that's where a sheep would find rest. Right, the shepherd would lead them to just this area of plenty, and they weren't in want. They would eat their fill, then they would just rest. Picture that scene. Do you rest well? So here's some questions I ask. Do you cease the things that drain you and lean into the things that fill you at least once a week? Is that your cycle of your week? Do you worship once a week in the community of others? Just take the focus completely off yourself in the presence of others and just worship a God who's all capable, knowing you're not. Do you do that? Are you realistic about what you can accomplish each day? each week? Like, do you actually wake up each day with a to-do list and a schedule that you can finish that's realistic? Or do you have a whole bunch of stuff in there and you never quite get it done because you set unreal expectations, so you never quite get to that rest? Which leads me to the next question. Do you finish your tasks? Do you set realistic expectations for yourself what you can do at work with your family and your friendships, whatever. And then do you finish them? Are you always leaving those things undone and then never being able just to be done and release and hand that back to God as a finished task? 
These are the things I ask myself. Is my work this week? Is my work today? Is my work this year? Is it effectual? Like, is there a point to it? Is it making a difference? Or is it just about pleasing people? Is most of what I do just about keeping the people happy who need to be happy in my life? You don't get rest from that. If that's why you do what you do, you're not getting rest from that. Once a week, do you rest as a child of God? Once a week, do you get to be a kid again and just be God's child? Not have to perform, not have to, you know, be competent, not have to be, you know, better than you were the day before. You're just a, you're just a child of God today. Ask yourself those questions. Because if you're not resting well, you're dishonoring what God listed right right at the beginning of his of his top ten keys to great living, right? Are you resting well every day, every week? David says, I choose to lie in green pastures. He leads me there and I submit. I rest well. The psalmist David actually in another part of, of the psalm says, God grants sleep to those he loves. That's a gift to us. We look at sleep sometimes as something we have to get to get recharged. So David says, no, 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 that's a gift. Like sleep is, don't take that gift for granted. He grants sleep because he loves you. And he wants that for you. Resting well is a big deal to God. Okay. The Lord is my shepherd. I choose for that. I shall not want. He makes me to lie in green pastures. I submit to it. And then finally, he leads me beside quiet waters, still waters. Boy, do we have a lot of noise in our world, right? And of course, David and then Jesus, as we follow his teaching too, they lived in a world, there was a lot of noise around them. And boy, do we know noise. We live in maybe the noisiest time ever. People sharing their viewpoints, pressures, all, it's just noise and then we have the capacity to add to it by by so much of the technology that's in our world we live in a really noisy time silence is it is we have to really push everything away hard to create space because noise noise is everywhere and noise does it noise can distract noise can frustrate noise can keep us from being rested Noise can add to the anxiety and fear in our life. Noise can have a lot of stuff that, that lead us away from God's will. And so the psalmist says, he leads me. I choose to follow him along quiet waters. So let's talk about this practice. The, the practice of creating noiseless spaces. For me... I pause two or three times a day and create just a few minutes of noiseless space. And then and then a practice for me, you know, you if if you followed Christ for very long, you've probably heard of the practice of fasting. And typically that means fasting from food, right? I think in our world, fasting from noise makes a lot of sense. And I try to do that on a regular basis. Fast from news, fast from podcasts. All of these things are interesting to me. There's nothing but fasting from noise, fasting from fasting from other maybe relational voices who's who 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 create a lot of noise in my life. I've got to fast from those sometimes and replace the noise. You can't live in a world with no noise. You've got to be in the noise. But sometimes you stop and take a break from it and in, in that in the place of noise. Create context and space for conversation with God. Moment for Him to speak in to the noise. I uh, I was in the line to get my car washed recently, and uh, and I witnessed something that I think for me has so much application to what we're talking about here in the twenty third Psalm. I was I was next up in front of me in in the stall there washing the the car which was a, a minivan in this particular case was uh was a what, what looked to me anyway to be a young mother in the minivan was 
multiple kids. I don't know if they were all her children or not, but there was there was at least three, maybe four children in the minivan, and she was out washing uh, this van. Uh, and 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 she had used uh, she had used coins, and I know now most of us swiped a car or whatever. But she had I'd watched her put the coins in, and and then the the timer came up came up on the uh, sort of the monitor up there, not the monitor, whatever that is that shows the time. And she's spraying, and 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 then you remember, you know what happens when you get to like a minute or a minute and a half, depending on which one, a beeper starts going off about every second. You know, beep beep beep. And you look up, and, oh, I don't have a lot of time. Well, she'd been going on. I noticed she was a little far behind. Like she's still putting, you know, still using the soap, and we're getting down to the beeper time. Like, ah, she's going to get close, right? And I'm watching this. And uh, sure enough, she looks up as if surprised and realizes that she's not going to make it. So while she's holding the, the wand there in, in, in one hand, she opens up her door. She looks in the minivan, and I don't know what it was she said exactly, but I assume, like, I need a dollar bill or I need quarters, and she's yelling in uh, and slamming the door and trying to go, and then she's opening, yelling some more, and then they're opening the door and yelling back out. It didn't look like to me they were able to find, you know, more quarters. I, I, you know, I'm not able to hear everything, but there's obviously yelling, and the yelling is clearly getting rather heated meanwhile this this loud like ming you know this noise just keeps going and going and the timer's going down and she's rushing around she switched it to rinse mode and she's rushing she's trying but she's not going to make it she's yelling more they're yelling back there's this whole chaos going right i mean it was incredibly entertaining now let me stop the story yes i should have thought to help okay i know that we're going to have another teaching sometime on my preoccupation with myself and how I'm working through that. That's not this teaching. Just let that go for now, okay? The point of the story is I'm watching this. It's just getting crazier, this minivan. We're down to like 20 seconds now. There's I can hear screaming going on. She, I think she knew somewhere where there must have been quarters, but they couldn't find. Anyways, it's this crazy thing. The timer runs out. The water shuts off. They're still so dripping from her minivan. She jumps in. Uh, and zooms out of there, right? Again, don't judge me. I enjoyed the whole scene. Thought this will be a great sermon illustration, probably. <laughs> okay, but next time I'll do better. Next time I'll, I'll help. But but this time, I didn't. But I did have this thought. I doubt she woke up that day saying, "I'm going to yell and scream at my kids," right? I'm going to rush through life and have enormous anxiety today. No, no, no. I bet she woke up that day with amazingly good intentions. And probably, to be fair, she probably is in an unwinnable situation. Could be. For all I know, she's she's a single mom with three jobs and, and in an unwinnable situation. So this really isn't about her. But my my life, see... I, I don't wake up each day saying, I'm going to pick up this fear and this anxiety and I'm going to take this on and I'm going to live my life in such a way that I kind of forget about God for a little while today and and I'm going to stress because I'm not able to handle every day in my life. Like, I don't wake up that way. That just happens, right? The noise and the insecurity and all this stuff. Unless I daily have a practice to choose, no, today, God will be my shepherd, and I'll just follow his voice. Whatever he provides, the resources, relationships, wisdom, money, all that stuff, will be enough. I'll choose to make it enough today. I shall not be in want. When he takes me to green pastures, I will rest well. I'll do my best to work and finish my work and work hard and work long as needed. But when it's time to rest, I'll give it back to him and I'll rest well. I'll put the noise out and I'll give him space to talk. And every day I'll walk through this practice and I'll walk through this practice. And it just has become more and more of the way I've learned to live. And I'd really encourage it to you. 
You know, I've watched these last few years. We had a few years, haven't we? Starting with COVID and political polarization and economic challenge and all kinds of stuff. And I've watched so many of us who who follow Christ, the noise and 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 the the fear and anxiety that's around us, it's invaded. It's invaded too many of us. We've forgotten that we follow a shepherd who has all wisdom, who knows the future and is leading us towards a great future. We've forgotten that, you know, like like I've heard this, I've heard, you know, that we're, we're in danger of the church failing and dying and all this kind of stuff. You know what? It's God's church. Jesus has been Lord of it for a long, long time now. And he shepherded the church, and he shepherded his followers followers through some real chaotic times. He can handle. He can handle 2024. He's got it. He knows it. He's got a plan. My job is not to figure everything out. My job is not to join the yelling and the screaming and add to the noise and add to the all. Oh, no. My job is to choose for him to be my shepherd. Take time to hear his voice. Do my best to follow. Rest well. Eliminate noise when needed. Can you do that? If you can do that, I'm telling you, you're going to live free. You're going to live differently than the people around you. They're going to ask, how is it that you live this way? How can you be at peace when everything around you is not peaceful? Ah, you say, let me introduce you to my Savior, my Lord, my Shepherd. It changes everything. And it'll change everything for the people around you too. I promise you that. Live well led. Live, live, live free. Live following a shepherd. He's seen it all. Wow. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, it's been my privilege to speak today, uh, really through a camera, but but I, I hope the way you're teaching me to live, and I haven't figured it out all yet, like even as I'm communicating this, Lord, you've shown, ah, there's an area you can still work on here, but you, you're teaching me how to follow you the way a sheep follows a shepherd. And again, I say to you, all that you've given in my life is yours. All that you've given is yours. I give it back to you. Today, I offer myself as a living sacrifice. And I ask that you help me with the things I don't know the answers to, I don't have the resources for. You know my challenges. Here they are. I'm so grateful for what you have given me. You've given me so much more than I deserve. Thank you for it. Thank you for it. I'll do my best to follow you, to listen to your voice today. Your will be done. Your kingdom come in me as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, I pray that for myself and for those who are listening. Amen. Amen. Thanks again for taking time to think through this, to listen. I hope God uses this in your life.